Hello plant lovers, it's Matthew in Melbourne in the kitchen again, welcoming you back to my channel. I do post every week and I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, either indoors or outdoors with no greenhouses or humidifiers or grow lights, etc. They're either indoors or outdoors or they're out of the pool. And today, plant lovers, I have just broken that cardinal rule because look, here is a box which we are going to open. And what's inside could scandalize you. Okay, plant lovers, why might the contents of this box be so scandalous? Well, I will show you because I am engaged in an experiment. Okay, there we are. And what is in here? It does not look like an orchid, but let's remove all of this. What do we have there? We have, ladies and gentlemen, a flask. Yes, plant lovers, I have bought myself a flask. Now, oh, so many things to go over about flasks, but let's start at the beginning. I have bought two flasks in the past. One, I had a 100% failure rate with. The second, a 100% success rate. So before we go anywhere, let's just say I am no expert about deflasking and growing orchids from a flask. Maybe if I tell you what it is, it will give some context as to why on earth I've done this. But also, I thought it might be interesting for you to see what a flask of orchids look like if you're remotely interested in going down this path. And there we are. First question then, why are the orchids in here? It's like a ship in a bottle. Um, well, orchid seeds are tiny and very susceptible to fungus and all sorts of outside negative forces, as Luke Skywalker may have said. So what is created in here is essentially a sterile humidity crib where the seeds are laid on a growing medium and the small plants grow in their own, I guess kind of terrarium, but sealed from the outside world from only bacterial and fungal and insect attacks. And when you see all the trouble that has to be gone to to produce flasks, you wonder how on earth orchids manage to propagate themselves in the wild, but they do. I guess with these, you're given a higher success rate per seeds that you would in the wild, where maybe one out of 100 seeds might actually nestle in the right spot to germinate. Here, you're pretty guaranteed that you're gonna get a better germination rate. In Australia, occasionally, if you're looking for a particular orchid, you'll only find it in a flask form, and that can be a bit daunting and a bit unfortunate because they are more expensive, but sometimes it's the only way, and that's the case with this one. So, let's have a look at it. It's a Doritus, which has now been put back in the Phalaenopsis family, but it actually doesn't look dissimilar to a Phalaenopsis, but it's quite different because the Doritus are terrestrial and they have an erect flower spike, which can be sequential. So quite different, but anyway, you can see why they're similar. The leaves do look the same as a regular Phalaenopsis, but they're terrestrial, not epiphytes. They have a wide range throughout Asia, from India all the way across to Sumatra and in Sri Lanka and in China, basically a massive range and plant lovers which is why i may be really stupid in buying this they are a warm to hot grower which means in the hottest sunniest part of the house is where this is going to live so the other thing about buying a flask is the economy of scale so this one was 60 dollars, which is really expensive i think however I might have at least 10 plants in there. Now, if five of them survive, I can then either sell them or swap them or do something else with them and maybe recoup some of those costs. So if you were a grower, for example, this is the way you'd go if you were really confident of being able to nurture the seedlings. I'm not, but let's engage on this experiment. I'm gonna open this up and pot them up and we can watch over the next, whoever knows how long, if they survive and if I manage to get some reasonable plants out of this flask. When I've bought flasks in the past, they're actually sent to you unflasked. So they've been removed from the bottle that the seeds have germinated in, and they're in a sort of like a, a twist top Tupperware container, um, which of course makes it much easier because I'm not quite sure how this is fastened. Anyway, come with me. Let's have a craft exercise and try and get the top off first. Okay, let's see how we go with this little baby. Goodness me. The most bizarre Christmas present ever. Well, there you go, foil top. Aha, so it's just a cork stopper, so that should be okay. Ta-da, <laughs> how easy was that? 
Okay, well, I'm relieved that that was actually quite easy to unbottle and I didn't have to smash the bottle. So what I'm now gonna do is tip them out and see how many plants we've got and pop them up. The minute that you get it, unflask it and pop them. Don't leave it because if they've already been deflasked, then the orchids are quite sensitive. They've been in this sterile environment for a long time. So you need to really get a move on and get them potted up. And I'll show you how I'm gonna pot them, which is what I've done in the past. Who knows if it will work with this particular one? Let's okay, hope. so this is what we're going to need. I'm sure, like me, you have got a million of these little black potlets that you get seedlings in. So I've just washed all of these, which I'm going to reuse. So the important thing is, with most orchids, not to overpot them. So this is really the smallest vessel I can find. And then in terms of the actual potting mixture, regardless of whether the plants are nepified or terrestrial or however it might finally be potted, this is how I've grown deflast seedlings in the past. So sphagnum moss, and what I'm doing is chopping it up really, really finely so that the pieces are just a little bit easier to manage in such a small pot. There we are. So the smaller the sphagnum moss bits, the, the more we're kind of gonna get into those little potlets, but without compressing it too much. Now, the other thing I'm going to add is some bark, and this is really quite small. It's sort of amongst the smallest size you can find, and then perlite. Because what we need to do is to encourage these plants to produce healthy root systems as soon as possible because that's how they're going to produce beautiful plants. The other thing I'm going to add into each pot is a little tiny dusting of mycorrhizal fungi because as we know, that assists plants in developing healthy root systems. Okay, let's see how many baby plants we have got in this flask. Okie dokie. This is less than scientific, I'm afraid. Hmm. It's feeling a little slimy, but actually, can you see there all of these small little green roots here? And then here we have the leaves of the baby plantlet. So quite healthy, vigorous root growth at this point. Let's see how many we've got. Now you can imagine they have been shaken up in transit and they've been through all manner of things. So this is really <laughs> quite a traumatic process for the seedling. So it's sort of understandable, I think, that you often get a failure rate. The other thing that I have learned from error is that regardless of what the ideal conditions are for the orchid that you've got in a flask, when you deflask them and pop them up for the first time, it's important to keep them somewhere warm and somewhere humid and to keep them moist, not wet, but moist, so that those roots can develop. Even if the orchid is a terrestrial, or it's an epiphyte, or it has a dry season, or it's cold tolerant, etc., 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 I always grow these indoors with good ambient temperature and lots of humidity, just to encourage the plants to grow well, and also just to kind of cushion the blow of being taken out of the womb, as it were, or in this case, a coffee jar. Okay, here we are. Here's a chopstick just to help us get the last ones out. And there we are. Is that it? No, there's more. Heavens to Betsy. All right, there we go. There are our plants. And you can see some of them are much bigger and more vigorous than others, which are still quite tiny. But this is the thing, so you get all of these baby plants. Now, obviously, you need a lot of patience for these to grow into full-sized, flowering-sized plants, but look at that one. That's a really large, healthy mini plant. So the other thing you can see is that kind of jelly substance. So that's the agar, I think it's called agar. It's a grow solution that's gonna promote those seeds to germinate and produce little plants anyway. So what I might actually do is just rinse this off and then we can get to potting. Okay, so I've rinsed those off to get rid of all the, <laughs> the amniotic fluid and there you can see the plants quite easily. Now sometimes when you buy a flask, because they've been grown in quite a confined space, you might find that all the roots are really tangled together. So a good way to deal with them immediately is to get a, a slightly larger pot and then just pot the whole bundle into a pot of chopped sphagnum moss like this, but not separating the plants. And then grow them on for quite a few months until they've stabilized and they look healthier. And then you can perhaps go through and separate out all the roots and pot them up one by one. But this one, as you can see, they've all come apart separately really quite easily. And the roots aren't that massive to have become entangled. Okay, so let us get on to the next step, which is 
creating some pots. I will pot the larger ones individually, but the smaller ones I'm going to just put together in pots so that they all have a fighting chance and can help each other <laughs> on the journey of life. All right, so a little bit of sphagnum, a little bit of perlite, there we are. So it's not packed in. And now with this one, for example, there really isn't that much root to actually pack in. So then I'm just going to lay that root on there and then just sprinkle a little bit of sphagnum and bark around the plant. There we go. So not too much pressure and it's still quite light in the pot. Now what I'm going to do is do all of these and then really water them all incredibly well. Okay, so as you can see, I've given them a real soaking so that all of that sphagnum moss is really moist and the bark is moist and the perlite. And what I'm gonna do now is transfer them into this saucer. So I put some pumice stone in here and basically I'll sit the seedling pots on here and then there'll always be a little bit of moisture just in the bottom just to create that sense of humidity. And you can see with this pot, basically I put all the little tiny ones in there around the edge, it's easier to pot them. And then we'll just see which, if any, perhaps all will survive. Then of course the other vital thing is to write a name tag because you need to know what it is that you have Pot it up. Doritus pulcherima lights. Crossed with <laughs> dark. Pretty poetic. There we are, plant lovers. I have 20 pots of these, which is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? So if you're in Melbourne, watch this space in a year or two, because I'm going to have to offload whatever of these have survived because I only need one. But that is the problem of flask growing. You end up with tons of plants, but it's a great opportunity to swap and trade and increase your collection by getting the one thing that you wanted. Now, the other important thing is I will not be fertilizing these. So I didn't put any fertilizer into the medium and I won't be fertilizing them. I would say, mm, well, for a couple of months until they're settled in and then only a very diluted, a weak solution of a seaweed based um, fertilizer. I normally dilute that to about one eighth of what's recommended. There's plenty of nutrients in and around the bark and the sphagnum. And what you want to do is to increase good root growth, not the plant to go, which you would if you fed it. So softly, softly, gently, gently on the fertilizer front. There we are plant lovers signing out from the kitchen. Thank you for watching. I must stress again, I'm not an expert at this deflasking business. I've done it twice, once an abject failure and once just about 100% success rate, different species of orchids. So let's see how we go with Doritus. You know, fingers crossed, it's a fairly tough plant. You know, Phalaenopsis are fairly tough. This is now part of the Phalaenopsis family. So let's see. I'll certainly check back in with these and keep you up to date with the progress, even if they all die and it's a complete failure. Anyway, why not have a go? The only hesitation I'd have is that flasks are quite expensive, but it is often the only way to get a more unusual orchid, particularly here in Australia. So I'm gonna give it a go. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. I post every week, so if that is of interest to see me stumbling through these amateur pathways of growing orchids, possibly failing spectacularly, do hit subscribe and you can follow those adventures. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next week with another orchidy adventure.